So welcome everyone to the third NDSU Soil Health webinar. I'm Naim Culver and with me are Dr. Abby Vick and Scott Swenson. Um, so uh, last, two, last two webinars, um, we have had mostly focused on dealing with wet fields. We compared uh, different tillage practices. Uh, Dr. Aaron Day presented uh, that topic and then Abby um, talked about dealing with wet fields by using cover crops. Today, we would want to uh, focus on a very important topic of wind erosion. Um, you know, early on uh, during this year, I was talking to one of my very good friends who is a farmer, and he mentioned to me, which was very striking, he said to me that, Naeem, some farmers still think that, you know, when their soil blows, that goes to their neighbor's field, and then they get it back when it blows from their neighbor fields. So essentially they consider that there's no wind erosion. That's, that's, that's not a loss. So he told me to make sure to communicate uh, this very clearly that not only we lose that topsoil, but it goes at times several hundred miles away. So that is a very important topic. And you know, weather in North Dakota is quite windy. I personally cannot think of anyone better than Dr. David Frenzen to talk about this. He not only has a lot of experience and great insight, but he has pictures which are quite chilling. I wanted to use the word very good pictures, but then I realized I shouldn't use the word good because when you would see those pictures, you will, it will have a chilling effect on you. And his topic is, um, phosphorus export from North Dakota, but when when he would when we would play his pre-recorded presentation, you would realize what he's basically talking about is a loss of topsoil and how much roughly phosphorus went with that. This is a presentation that I put together uh, for the Governor's Historical Society about ten years ago, roughly. I'm Dave Franzen. I'm a professor of soil science and extension soil specialist, mostly soil fertility, but also some soil health things. I work with Neem Kalbar, Abby Wick, Kayla Gash, Chris Augustine, and others with some soil health topics. So about 10 years ago, the society gave me a column on the history of fertilizer application in North Dakota. And I heard the word governor and I said yes. And I hung up the phone and thought, what in the world did I do? I'm going to talk for half hour, 45 minutes on a graph of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash since 1950 to present. That'll take all of two minutes. So I started to think about it. And I started to think about one of the one of the stories that I've heard from, from older farmers about the buffalo bones. And so, so I decided to dig in and find out what I needed to know about that. So one of the things that, that a person needs to understand going into this is that when settlers came to North Dakota, this was a vast prairie, uh, very few trees around, maybe some of the major streams and rivers and the in the state had trees alongside of them, but for the most part, very, very, very deep, hairy soils. Uh, a lot of them less than uh, 10,000 years old, uh, east of the Missouri River, and then there were older soils, more fragile soils, West River, but they had very relatively high levels of available nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The native calcium, magnesium, micronutrient levels were very high. It was, um, what the bank of nutrients that have been gathered by plants in a prairie, graze prairie situation for at least 10,000 years, if not longer. So I know when you go to certain art studios and see those nice little uh, pictures, those paintings of the early pioneers going through the tall grass and, and, uh, with the wagons and everything. Uh, occasionally you see a, 
a buffalo skull by the side of the trail, but uh, but this is really what it looked like. There are just bones everywhere. This is a picture from 1887 from someplace in North Dakota, and, and this is really common. And I think some people are surprised by that because the general understanding is that the natives used all the parts of the buffalo. And that is all true, that natives used all the parts of the buffalo, but they didn't I mean, how many can a, can a family really use, you know, as a shovel, a scapula, or any other thing? So, so their bones just scattered out all over the place. Some of these bones, of course, was from the Great Slaughter, uh, the tribe, the reservations, but just naturally, the, the, the buffalo would die, the wolves and the coyotes and everything else would eat them, bones would be left behind. Um, the herds would walk over them and crush some, but you know you have you have hundreds of years of bones laying out there in the prairie, so that is kind of what it looked like. So here's some recollections of people that uh, had to deal with this. This is from a young farmhand in Richland County, A. J. A. G. Divot from 1882 complained in a letter. He said the bones had to be removed from the path of the plows because the plows, once they hit them, they stopped and, and just made a mess. But uh, many, many people made money trading them, selling them to traders. Here's a, another person, Carl M. Sagan, from who farmed between Grafton and Park River. He noted at first the bones were a nuisance. That was when they first settled between 1880 and 1884. And then a bone market opened up in Park River in 1885, and they received $13 a ton, which is big money back then. So the settlers and others, uh, because not all the land was claimed at that, would go out, go out in the prairie, gather bones, and then take them to a place where they would be sold, piled up, and then shipped uh, generally to the east to use for various things. This is a, a picture of a pile of bones near Fort Totten in the 1880s. Here's an advertisement uh, in 1885 from the Grafton News and Times. Notice to farmers, I'll pay cash for buffalo bones, bring them in by the ton or the hundred. I'll give 50 pounds of the best twine for one ton of buffalo bones this month only, or a $40 sewing machine for 40 tons. I want 5,000 tons this month. Uh, actually, that's kind of cheap compared to other other prices I've seen up to $20 a ton for bones from time to time. Here's some Metis Indians with a two-wheel two -wheel Red River carts hauling bones near Minnewaukan. Here's some more stories. Sometimes uh, little towns when they had their centennials uh, here about 30, 40 years ago would, would get uh, recollections from people that were still uh, alive at the time, and, and these are some of them. This is from 1880 in Colum, North Dakota. First several years were especially hard due to crop failures and low prices. Buffalo Bowl and Dale in exchange for food and flour. Ellendale was the nearest town at the time and was 42 miles from their farm. This is from the same area. Mr. Kruger broke up about 10 acres of land the first year. But the year was a drought year and he didn't even get his seed back. Uh, Mr. Kruger with nothing else to do after seeding started picking up buffalo bones and the bones were sold Edgley and Ellendale and received about $12 a ton. He would go out one day and home the next with a wagon load of bones, camping out overnight, and sold about $70 worth of bones during the early part of the summer in 1889, and this helped the Kruger family quite a bit as they had no other income. And another recollection from Lair, North Dakota in 1890, they planted their first flax crop and collected buffalo bones took them to Ellendale and received $2 a wagon load. So this is just common. Uh, this is a part of the way that early settlers were able to survive during the first two, three years that they were on the property. Here's a Menace Indian caravan arriving at Devil's Lake uh, at the St. Paul, Manitoba and Minneapolis Railroad Station in 1885 and prices for bones went as high as $20 a ton that year. Each wagon contained about 1,200 pounds of bones. And here's um, settler wagons with bones arriving in Minot on July 3rd, 1889. 
and here's a poem, Pile of Bones and Mine Out about the same time in 1889. These are loaded up into um, in the railroad car, so it was all hand labor, uh, unloaded it, got paid for it, and then people would load the load the bones into box cars mostly. This happened all all along the northern prairies. This is an illustration in Montana, the one on the top, and down below is um, one in North Dakota getting ready to load up into the northern Pacific. And Saskatchewan, you can find references in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, piled by a railway siding, and these on the on the bottom is uh, near Ellendale in 1888. Another advertisement, wanted dry buffalo bones. A person seems to be buying everything from scrap iron to bones and hoofs. Uh, bone black fertilizers, etc. So that's what they were sending them to make in St. Louis, Missouri. This is not a fertilizer manufacturer. This is um, for industrial uses outside of, uh, outside of Detroit. In 1892, a pile of buffalo bone skulls. So, if that looks familiar, if you've ever seen the movie *Revenant*, there's a picture from a dream scene after the after the star, the lead actor, gets mauled by a bear outside of Lemon, South Dakota. He has this dream, and uh, looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, so a typical fresh bone meal guaranteed analysis about three percent nitrogen, fifteen percent phosphate and 3.15.0 in fertilizer vernacular. So uh, after a time most of the nitrogen is probably going to leach into the soil but the phosphorus would have been would have been taken up. We don't have any records from North Dakota on how much was shipped out of here because the Northern Pacific place where this these records were stored uh, had a fire and burned but we have records from Kansas uh, who had uh, we think about similar numbers of bones out in their prairies they had an earlier trade uh, that area was was settled earlier than than North Dakota so from 1872 to 74 the Santa Fe Railroad and others they shipped over 3.2 million tons of bones to the east so we 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 think that about the same number of bones were were taken east from here also. And if that was the case, it contained 15%. If you do the math, about 480,000 tons of P205 were shipped out of North Dakota east and removed from the ecosystem. And to compare, that's about two years of phosphate fertilizer application at today's present rates, which are at historic highs. So that's really interesting. Uh, that uh, that would take up another 10 minutes of that 45 minute talk. Uh, and so, um, but then I started thinking about probably uh, what I thought might have been at least as much of a phosphate export as buffalo bones. And that was when we lost our topsoil, which in some areas of the state is still ongoing when it gets dry. This is a picture of a dust storm aftermath in McKenzie County uh, back in the 30s. So remember the, the, first, the first slide I, I showed you was the prairie was this bank of, of nutrients that had been built up over thousands and thousands of years. Uh, Topsoil is very thick. I'll show you some evidence for that in a minute. The people that came here were, for the most part, pretty smart people and they, they conducted agriculture the way they were taught to conduct agriculture, the only way that you could conduct agriculture. And this is a uh, farmer or a farm hand on one of the premier tractors of the day with one of the premier in implements of the day in the Red River Valley, somewhere between 1910 and 1915. The, the fields had to be plowed and then worked and then worked and then worked four or five, six times in order to get them the consistency of flour because many of you have seen those old planters. They don't have any weight to them. Um, so 
in order to get the get the seed at the right depth, you you had to have it just as loose as flour. And and this is fine from where they they came from. I mean, some of these people came from Nor Norway or Germany or anywhere else in Europe and the eastern United States, surrounded by trees and you know anywhere where a stiff wind is about 10 miles an hour and this this worked really well i mean they had to fight water erosion certainly but but wind erosion is something that they, most of them didn't ever have to deal with and of course the natives that lived out here that it how how could they tell them anything about the wind because to them this is this is wrong side up, you know, the roots, you know, the grass roots are up instead of down. So they, they, they would never have, have plowed, plowed any soil. The agriculture that was conducted along the Missouri River, uh, for example, the Mandans and, and other tribes along the Missouri, uh, conducted farming pretty much like the Egyptians did. They waited for the, for the spring flood to recede, it, deposited silt along the river banks and the flood plains and then they go in with their sticks and they put the seeds in the ground their corn and their squash and and their beans and and sunflowers whatever else <clears throat> and that's how they did it they never turned the turn the field over so th this was this was the first time so letters to the east <laughs> always talked about how windy it was that people couldn't believe how windy it was all the time and references the people that plowing or had plowed or had plowed talk about the soil blowing i mean the soil the soil always blew but there really wasn't any concern in anybody for quite some time even though there were some losses and then in the late 20s 28 maybe 29 certainly the weather started to turn dry. This is corn growing up by Minot, North Dakota, about 1929, 1930. So things started to get dry, crop failures, and again, they're working the ground five, six times, and getting at the consistency of flour, and the rain didn't come, and the wind started to blow. So my colleague, Tom DeSutter, he has an office next to me, uh, teaches and does research at NDSU. He, he does hospice, volunteer hospice work. Uh, you know, as a uh, service to the community. And uh, he was working with one uh, retired farmer and got his, uh, his family's permission to use this information. So this is Orville Stenerson from Dodge North in the 30s. Uh, 1932 was a good year, but 33 was a bad year. 34 was dry with lots of dust. 1935 was a good year with rains. I suppose everything is relative. 1936 was a very bad year, the worst. Lots of dust and grasshoppers. They had three loads of hay compared to 20 to 30 in a good year. Dust black in the sky. They had to turn on oil lamps to see at noon inside. They sold all their livestock. They kept only a dairy cow. They had to use Russian thistle for forage. That's all they had. There wasn't any wheat that year at all. 1937 was better than 36, but still bad. So this made a tremendous impression on this young man uh, at that time. After that slide, I was uh, given a form of this talk up by Gilby, North Dakota, uh, here several years ago, and a retired farmer just st stood up in the back of the room, started talking, and, and, and this is a part of what he said. He's, he spoke for about five or 10 minutes, but this is, these are some ideas that I took away from him. I'm out of nowhere and sometimes last for days. In some storms, we lost feet of soil. We stuffed papers and rags the inside of the house was still dusty and hard to see. After the storm, we had to dig out the fences because the stock had walked over them. So these were nasty times. Uh, we hear about the Dust Bowl from Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, but it hit North Dakota just as hard. So by the mid thirties, the US, USDA had finally uh, so finally figured out that wind erosion was a huge problem in the Great Plains. So that black area in the center of the country, uh, that's us, that's part of us. So here's some photographs from that period of time. This is in Emmons County, just east of Bismarck. That's a fence. And apparently this is very common. Notice the person's tie. 
in the mid thirties, the USDA started hearing some feedback from North Dakota on how horrible it was. So they sent out a representative out to the area. His name was, uh, was Russell. And so he took several photographs that, that are now Library of Congress. This is a photograph of, of Williston in 1937 in the background. Uh, nothing but scrub and, and see how the soil is just, you know, those, those are dunes, those are little dunes. Here's a horse pasture, quote unquote, during the dust storm near Williston, 1937, another Russell image. So my personal image, uh, one image that I, that I bought myself, it's a dust storm in Huron, South Dakota, taken November 12th, in 1933 and it's 11:55 in the morning and uh, the street lights are on you can barely see that vehicle uh, there but uh, it's as dark as night this is a huge dust wall coming down onto watertown south dakota in the 30s sometime this is another daytime Picture. This is from Watertown, May 9th, 1934, 3 p.m. on a course. This is a huge dust storm coming in on uh, Gregory, South Dakota, which is just south of here. Oh, uh, what, 60 miles maybe? In 1934. This is the aftermath of, of one of those Gregory, South Dakota dust storms. And then farmstead, abandoned machinery, uh, maybe the old family car, maybe the new family car, everything just covered with what used to be topsoil. This is a person, there's actually a, a video trying to walk against the wind in 1936 on a field. You can bear, you can just hardly imagine it's a field, but it's a field. And um, walking into the wind, it's. Um, hurricane force. This is the aftermath again. Soil drifting over a hog house, 1935, South Dakota. So uh, the farmers didn't have any money, they didn't have any crops, their fields were ruined in many, many places. The, the soil was just... Some of you uh, have heard of or know uh, or have seen Mick Kerr when he was on TV or listened to him on the farm radio. He grew up in uh, in McLeod, North Dakota, which is just on the western edge of the of the Cheyenne grasslands. Well, the Cheyenne grasslands, uh, every quarter section there was farmed. And Mick told me that he and his dad would go out there sometimes and and ride around and he'd point you know, over here and say that, you know, Johnson's lived over here and Smith's lived over here. And there was a house in every quarter section and everybody farmed and it was a very prosperous area. And then it got dry and those sensitive sandy soils started to blow. And after several years, everybody moved away. So a lot of these areas were just deserted that uh, the farmers just moved away. So the people that the people that remained, of course, there wasn't anything to feed the stock with. So the government had a program where you bring in a cow or a pig or whatever, horse, and uh, and you would get a certain amount of money. I think ten dollars for a steer, maybe ten dollars for a horse. You drop them off. The government would shoot them, put them in a pit, and um, most of them had dust pneumonia anyway, so they were going to die one way or the other. So it was a very, very tough time, tough, tough, tough. One of the things that, that the farmers do a lot now, um, many of them still think that way, despite educational programs, but, but they think that after a dust storm, the only soil that moved was what was in the ditch. And some of them joke about trading soil with the neighbor. But they forget that the, the dust storm is a three-dimensional beast that has height as well as as left and right. So here is a clipping from 1934 from the Bismarck Tribune on commenting on a dust storm that uh, happened in late April. Whole thing, uh, but it, 
These dust storms uh, occurred on April 21st, 22nd. The velocity of wind was greater on the 21st, but the volume was greater on the 22nd. And the 22nd was remarkable because it was on a Sunday and travel plane was hazardous and diff difficult, which is tough because travel. And several aviators at all levels up to 14,000 feet. So there's height with these dust storms. So they didn't have satellites back then, but we have satellites now. And, and so we can look at some of these dust events and, and we can see how vast they are. This is loose region. Uh, also a very windy, very er eroded area in the United States. And those dust plumes over a hundred miles long. And how much of that went in the ditch? How much of that was traded with the neighbors? A little, but most of it blew away. And the same is true with any dust storm that we see in this area also. So the USDA assessed what, what happened during the 30s uh, in North Dakota. Almost 600,000 600, acres had really serious erosion. They really needed methods to ensure continued product. Acres are so severely eroded that further for was economically unfeasible. So we have millions of acres of range in the state, and part of it is because the topsoil blew away and that's all it's good for. And then we have the grasslands, and that used to be farmed and now it's not. So some of that land has probably come back into crops, but a lot of it has just been lost forever for, for crop production and, and sustains marginal livestock production. At pro so the USDA made a, a nice little map here in 1936 about the soil losses during the first part of the 30s. The black uh, in, indicates areas where moderate wind erosion, which I kind of have to chuckle at that, is 25 to 75 percent topsoil loss. They've um, denoted as uh, as moderate. Dotted is slight wind erosion, 25% topsoil loss. And then in the southwest part of the state, the oblique is a total of wind and water erosion, 70, 75% topsoil loss. So that's, that's the first half of the 30s with the other half still to go. So in 1933, a memo to the Secretary of Agriculture said that it was estimated that topsoil losses reduced annual productivity 15 to 25 percent, and when the soil was fully stripped, fields became unproductive or barren. So here we started with a prairie soil in that grazed environment, and that soil organic matter present at the time was a thousands of years of soil and plant and microorganism activity and in many, many places that it all disappeared and certainly have been sorely reduced. If you look back at the records, our initial wheat yields in the state were really high, particularly in the eastern part of the state. Uh, it was cited by a historian, Hiram uh, Drockey, that uh, works at, or worked at Minnesota State um, University of Minnesota Moorhead uh, for many years. Uh, 30 bushels an acre, uh, 1890 near Jamestown, and near 50 bushels an acre in some years in Walsh County. There, there's, there's, many, there's many years where people are gonna be happy with yields like that today. And back then they were using marginally adapted varieties. They were using uh, planting equipment that was just uh, one step above what the Egyptians used 3,000 years ago. Uh, you know, there wasn't any fertilizer. They didn't have much trouble with weeds back then. The, the weeds that were imported from Europe didn't have a chance to be established. But it's just, it's remarkable that with, with the crude technologies at the time, they were getting yields that in some years we would still be happy with today. All of that would only be possible if all of those nutrients that were needed for those uh, excellent crops were provided from the soil because there, there was no fertilizer applied. Today, if we put in a, a field of fallow, it's um, 
rare, really, that we see over 100 pounds of end per acre coming off our fallow soil because our soils have been degraded so much. So the soil that blew away, people ask, well, where in the world did it go? Well, it went everywhere. Um, oceanographers, uh, people that study the oceans and the sediments between them, uh, they they core down into the into the ocean and uh, read it like tree rings, uh, years of deposits, and some of that is dust. Some of it is what washes into the the ocean to create those deltas, but uh, a lot of it is just dust from wherever. The dust falls everywhere. It just circles the globe. Most of it goes many many miles away. Some of the some of the dust storms that were happening in the Great Plains uh, affected small and larger cities. There's records from Chicago, for example, of having to bring out plows to clear the streets after some events. Uh, they were finding uh, inches of inches of sediments in Central Park in New York, and so. There one group of researchers that during that period of time would go out and, and take samples of that and then, were, and then compare it to what, what was left on the prairies. And uh, some people went out in Central Park and took some samples and what they found is that uh, the soil that they were taking out of the dust was had 19 times more phosphate than what was left in the prairies from where they thought it came from 10 times more organic matter, nine times more nitrogen, 45 times more potassium. So all the good stuff, all the good stuff ended up somewhere else and certainly not in the neighbor's field. Here's another example. Uh, this is in kilograms per hectare over on the left, but if you look at the 1.2, 1.4, that's equivalent, uh, if I recall, somewhere around 25 bushels an acre or so. So we're averaging somewhere around 25 bushels an acre back in 1880, 1890, all the way in 1910. And then it started to decline. Uh, the weather was still decent but the topsoil had started to leave. And then in the 30s when it got dry, of course, the yields. During the war effort, the rains came back and, and yields increased some, but notice they never came back to where they were in 1900. Consistently in where they were in 1900 until people started for non-fertilizer. So my estimates of topsoil lost, and I think this is conservative, is about 12 inches off the hilltops, eight inches off the slopes. Six inches of topsoil lost in North Dakota from about 30 million acres of cropland, and the total weight of that is around 30 billion tons. It would have been typical then and now to find phosphate in uh, acre slice, six inches of soil. And if that is the case, then the total phosphate loss during uh, the 30s would have been about 30 million tons or about a of phosphate application at today's present historically high rates. So after the 30s, it was all fixed. People uh, understood what needed to be done. And many winter. Of course not, you know, we've all seen problem. So, so there were big erosion events in, in the 40s, uh, particularly in the 50s. There were some in the 70s. And then if uh, people are as old as I am, uh, who can't forget those lovely years of 80, 87 to about 1990, uh, when townships had to use their trucks to take the, take the soil off of, of streets in many towns and cities in North Dakota with all the wind and all the drought. So here's a picture from a field edge in the 1950s in Grand Forks, and that's not snow, that's soil. And we continue to lose uh, erosion and have soils damaged. About 13% of our cropland was damaged in 1977. About 2.1 million acres lost about an inch of soil in 1980. Uh, again, another event in 1982, and it continues and continues and continues. There's more alarmed about continual soil loss. 
And I think the reason is because they mask the effects with the tillage. They don't have any check for a reference or they, they ignore the obvious. There are a lot of, since, since it's gotten wet, a lot of these stone piles, these rock piles, particularly in the eastern part of this, the state, but also places around Missouri River have been used as quarries to shore up ditches and culverts and stream banks and things. But there's still plenty of them out there. And if you look real close, you can see that some of these are on pedestals that they're, they're not the surface of the present soil. They, they're, they indicate the, present, the, the surface of the soil as it was when the rock piles first were built. And so they, they kind of stand up on these little things, anywhere from six inches, 12 inches, maybe higher than that. But I think this is the, the, the big thing that happens. Uh, you have cultivation and erosion, you have hidden soil losses, and the soil profile just gets narrower. So at the beginning, uh, what we're looking at here is kind of how soil scientists think of the soil. We're always, um, we always think of the soil as if we're standing in a pit. Soil science, soil scientists are always in the pits. We're always depressed, right? So, so anyway, we're looking at it from the side here and we, we see what we call horizons. The A horizon uh, in a prairie soil, very, very dark, uh, very black color for the most part in the western part of the, the state that tends to be a little bit more, more dark brown than black, but still very, very dark and, uh, and at the very big beginning pretty thick, two, three feet in many cases. And then the B horizon underneath that, that's a zone where the roots and the chemistry have been working, where there's maybe clays that have moved from the surface soils down to the subsoils and increase there from where it used to be, or there have been lime that's deposited from deeper depths or salts that have been brought up. Some kind of chemical biological change has taken place. And then the sea below that is the original parent material where there hasn't been a lot of change. Typically pretty low organic matter in that area. Highest organic matter in the A, a little bit less in the, in the B background noise in the sea. So consider you're, you're broken up the prairie for the first time. Uh, you have two feet of about 7% organic matter soil. You turn it over, it looks really black. Uh, some blows away, but goodness, you know, there's enough there for about a thousand years, so who cares? And so uh, you're plowing and working and the wind blows and the wind blows and wind blows and wind blows and then after about 30, 40 years or something like that, uh, you're looking back in your tractor and it still looks black to you. Well, instead of about two feet of black, you've got maybe the depth of the plow black, maybe eight inches black. Still looks black to you. It's not as deep as it was, but you don't know the difference. And then as it keeps eroding, you start to plow into the bee. And instead of seven and a half percent organic matter soil, all of a sudden you get six, and then you have five, and then you have four, and then you have three and a half. But you're looking back at the tractor after you get done plowing or working the ground, it still looks black to you. And you keep on going and keep on going, and it keeps eroding and keeps eroding, and the B gets blended in with the A, and all of a sudden you're starting to work into the C. And so you have this dark zone that still looks black to you. As far as you know, it's the same black as your great grandfather had in 1880, but it, it surely isn't. But to you, you know, there's really no difference. There's no point of reference. And you're working into the sea and you have three and a half and then three and then two and a half. And that's how it works. You look in the back of the tractor, it still looks black to you, but it's not. So a uh, graduate student of, of Dave Hopkins, another colleague of mine, uh, they revisited some soil survey sites that were characterized in 1960 uh, by the SCS, which is now the NRCS. And what they found uh, is, is this. This is, this is one, one site in Western Walsh County in 1958 when it was first characterized on that the plow layer was about six inches thick that uh, they had two B horizons that they characterized. The K means that it has uh, some lime accumulated in them. 
and it went down to 34 inches. And then the sea horizon, the relatively untouched, unadulterated parent material, the depth from the surface to, the, to that was about 34 inches. When Dave and Brandon came back in in 2014 and ran a transect across the same area to capture the same soil that was characterized in 1958, they found that the distance from the surface to the sea horizon was only 15 inches. So they lost 19 inches of topsoil during that period of time. And the farmer had no idea. Still looked black to them. Uh, on the right, you'll see a serious eroded uh, soil near Buffalo, North Dakota, on a what's you know mapped to barn soil, and you can see that abrupt dark, and then white, and and that means that that you're pretty well farming farming sea horizon there. That the dark up on top is just a blend with a poor poor memory of what the topsoil used to be, uh, right on top of the sea horizon. Sometimes if you get down into the pits and start looking around, you can find some evidence of what the soil used to look like many, many, many years ago. Uh, these are old worm channels or sometimes gopher holes. Uh, Russian name form is Crota Venus. Uh, they fill up with the organic matter from up above. It just kind of washes into it after, over time. And here's a either a worm hole or a root channel from deeper in the soil. And look how black it is compared to the soil up around it. Just there's no comparison between the two. The black in there is probably six, seven percent, and the, and the organic matter above it is probably somewhere around three. So anyway, it's a little bit of a look in the past, the way the soil used to look. Here's some additional evidence, and you can find some for yourself. If you, a lot of these old soil surveys are scanned now, and you can find them on the internet. And this is one from Divide County in 1900, the Divide Soil Series, uh, was described as having 16 inches of very black topsoil. And Divide Soil Series, you can find some, of course, in Divide County, but you can also find it um, West River. I've, you know, there's, there's some mapped West River. Um, and uh, today it doesn't have really any black topsoil. The best you could say is it has a light gray topsoil. And so the, the losses on those soils are at least a foot because uh, it's not very black anymore. Cascade with us, uh, a wheatland soil. I've worked in a soil survey in 1903, described it as having two feet of topsoil with organic matter of 6.9%. And today it has around 2% organic matter and it's lost everything. It's lost everything. And then uh, they also describe a Miami loam, which is probably something close to a Bearden. It described it as having three feet of 7% organic matter soil. And a Bearden today uh, is most often about six inches of four plus on these Bearden soils is probably two and a half feet. And the Fargo soil series in 1903 was described as having two feet of very black topsoil. And today it's around six inches of four and a half to five five and a half percent topsoil. So the losses on these soils have just been incredible. So the topsoil again contains about a ton of phosphate and North Dakota's probably lost an additional six inches of topsoil from crop acres since 1940. And if that's the case, and I think it's true and probably conservative, we've lost another 12 and a half million tons of phosphate and 40 million tons of nitrogen, and that's equivalent of 75 years of nitrogen and phosphate application that farmers apply today at present rates. And in many areas of the state, it still happens. If you want to see a dust storm come the first time it dries out this spring in, in uh, the Red River Valley, especially the Northern Valley, and, um, and just kind of drive around, and hopefully in an old car, because uh, your other car will be pitted with all the sand and the, and the soil that's blowing around. But, uh, but this is very common as, soon as, as, as as soon as the soil dries out because there are very few fields in this area that are uh, no-till, strip-till. Uh, more of them have cover crops than they used to, but still it's a very heavily cultivated area. So the aftermath of a late 90s dust storm uh, in, the, in the valley, that's a, the aftermath soil fill in the ditch several feet 
in depth. These are other pictures of soil filling the ditches and then look at that cloud above it. I mean, all that fine stuff, all that good stuff is just blown, blown away. Um, probably hundreds of miles. Certainly not in the neighbors. Of course, stuff gets in the ditch, the really good fine stuff, that's, that's what goes away. So there was a lot of work about roughing up the soil, but that only lasts for about one dust storm and then it's all gone and, and then you got to deal with the aftermath. So uh, most of the time you get more than one event a season. People laugh at snurt, but it's not funny. It's just an indication it's to be the soil in the ditch is supposed to be white and if it's not, uh, things in the field need to be fixed. They're loath to, to use no-till and strip-till on as, as sugar beets. They're just scared to death that, that we don't have uh, the equipment to go through residue uh, with these things. But that, that's not true. This is in the 1930s. We, we have, you can go to farm shows and, and for any kind of field situation, you can find farm machinery that can, that can go through and plant uh, in a reasonable manner through any, any kind of residue that you can think of. People try to use some residue and um, use some, what they call conservation tillage, but this just slows the inevitable. You're still gonna lose soil. Look along the tree and you can see dust blowing across the field. Most of our, most of our tree belts in the state have reached maturity and are on the other side um, and starting to die off. Uh, some people think it's spray, but I think in most cases the, the, the tree they don't last 2,000 years. A normal, normal lifespan of a cottonwood is probably 50, 60 years, something like that. Uh, some of these other trees that are grown in the shelter belts, the ashes and others, you know, about 50, 60 years and they start to go away. So this is just reasonable. They need to be renovated um, and not just torn out and, and forgot about. They're there for a reason. Uh, they really helped. Before there was no-till. Now the people in the West are in no-till and the tree rows aren't quite so important anymore, but it still slows the wind quite a little bit. It's a picture of uh, sugar beets growing in, in, in no-till out in Montana. Of course, they don't have the moisture problems that we do here in the East, so maybe no-till is not the right thing to do, but certainly something like strip-till certainly could be and has been shown to be very effective. This is some strip-till corn growing down in Rutland, and I took 250 bushel corn off of these plots here a few years ago. Uh, extremely productive, uh, very long-term no-till over 40 years. Piled for 20 years, um, high clay soils just like there are in the valley. Um, Strip-till strip -till corn, uh, 250 bushels. And it's hard to have any conventional field that would beat a farm like this. So my campus plots, it's no-till beets, strip-till beets. Um, never found a difference in yield between the conventional till and the, and the strip. So strip-till beets again. Strip-till is good for, for row crops uh, and uh, particularly those that are warm season, uh, but even, even sugar beets works pretty well. And if nothing else, at least put a cover crop in there. Uh, I know this last year, you know, we're, we're speaking here in spring of 2020, that fall was not really conducive to plant a cover crop, but if that was put into a person's schedule, in most years you'd be able to put some in, and that at least offers some protection from wind erosion, even water erosion in most years. So to kind of wrap things up, despite historic high fertilizer nutrients, levels of phosphate on many North Dakota farms are still low. And we probably have at least 200 years of no soil loss and continued phosphate application to catch up to where we were in 1890. The soil loss uh, helps answer these questions because I get these questions from time to time from people that are in conventional tillage. Why don't my soil phosphate values improve? You know, well, because they seem to blow away every year. Why is my soil pH increasing? It's because the subsoil and most of our soils is very high in lime and pH and you keep digging up 
more subsoil and putting it, uh, mixing it with the topsoil. So of course your pH is increasing. And why do I have more soil crusting? It's because your organic matter is very low and uh, your good stuff blows away. And with lower organic matter, you have a greater problem with soil crusting and you're mixing in your sea horizon, which has hardly any structure to it at all and with your topsoil. So all of those questions are was blowing away. The only remedy for continued soil degradation is no-till or modified no-till such as strip-till. So to summarize, North Dakota has a long history of phosphate export, first on purpose with the buffalo bones, and but the second as an unintended consequence. Soil fertility is intimately related to soil conservation, and the only way to restore soils is through a long-term no-till commitment. So thank you for viewing this presentation. This is my contact information below. You're welcome to contact you. Happy to talk with you or visit with you over an electronic device. Thank you. So I have a chat question here. Uh, and the question is, how much sulfur could we credit from a 7% organic matter soil? Uh, if you add 7%, uh, we would normally give a 100 pound of nitrogen credit, and I think you'd be very safe crediting 10 pounds of sulfur from that as well. About a 10 to one ratio is about typical. So I'll ask you a question, Dave. Um, with, the, with the organic matter percentages, um, what numbers are we trying to get back up to? And I know this varies by soil type, but what, what numbers do you think we would need to be at to, to see some reduced crusting issues or um, better fertilizer releases in some of these, these soils that have been eroded? Well, we're seeing crusting in, in say, something like a Fargo soil that has organic matter of five, five and a half percent. I, I think those soils, once you get up to about seven percent, you're probably in pretty good shape. I know you, we worked down at Rutland with, with Joe Brecker for a while and, you know, what, neighbors seem to have a little crusting problem down there with their three and a half percent organic matter soil, but his seven percent organic matter soil, I've never seen that be a problem for him. So I think once you get about seven, if you're in the western part of the state, I think once you get up to maybe five percent or so, then maybe even less than that, then the, the crusting problem tends to go away. Also the residue in the surface prevents that from happening because the soil doesn't dry like a brick like it does if it's bare. So it, it always has a little bit more moisture in, uh, in, a, in a drier environment or a, after heavy rain, that's, a, that's an advantage. There's another question um, I get from the producers that um, some of them don't like the trees because they say that, you know, around the shelter bells, um, you know, there's more snow and then those areas dry out um, it takes a longer time for those areas to dry out. So actually some of the some of the people don't like the trees and they would not want to replant and they want to get rid of the existing trees. Yeah, I I I I understand that that the people see them as a little bit of a nuisance, but uh older older farmers um they comment that how horrible it was and the trees really made a huge difference. I, I challenge people to think about that, uh, to ask themselves what their field, how productive their field really would have been if those tree rows had not been there. You know, I, I am very reluctant to do any any research to compare yields next to a tree row what yields out in the middle of the field because you're assuming that those fields and the, the soils in the middle of the field are just as productive if they wouldn't have been when the if the tree rows had not been there, but that's not true. It would have been much reduced in productivity uh, and probably required more fertilizer as well if the tree rows had never been there. And so I I just I challenge people to to um, take a deep breath, maybe think about. I know it's hard to imagine you know with planters that are you know God knows up to a hundred feet wide. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you've got 80% of the field that, um, that, that's ready and 20% isn't, um, you know, do you really have to put one crop in one field? 
can't you put a later crop in the what's going to be next to the tree row? I don't know, just something to think about. You're not going to have to worry about that every year. Of course, we've we've worried with that a lot of times during from '92 to present, but uh, just a different way to think about it. And I guess I wouldn't be so I was I, I wouldn't be so depressed watching tree rows come out if the farmers that were taken about were going to no-till and fixing their tillage while they were doing it. But most of them don't. I mean, they, they take out the tree route and they continue to take the chisel plow out and make it as black as they can. It, it just, it, it, they, had, they need to do one or the other or else suffer the consequence or else suffer like the soils around Grafton are and gradually turn white, you know, and lose all their topsoil after a period of time. I, I'll never forget, a, a, we had a group of, of farmers visit from Kazakhstan a number of years ago and and they were sugar beet farmers and they were talking about how much nitrogen of course through an interpreter and how much nitrogen they required to to have their beets and they were talking about using over 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre and I just I just kind of smiled I, I, I told them that if we use 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre we'd have we'd have beets the size of pumpkins and and sugar down to 14 percent and after uh, after huddling for a, a few minutes, they said that's we we have the same sugar content and the same yields that you do. We just have to use that much, and the reason they have to use that much is because those soils have been farmed for a thousand years, and and goodness, you know, their soil is just it was depleted 900 years ago, and so with the loss of all their organic matter and having to farm things that are one to one and a half percent organic matter, which is pretty much what the roots are. Um, they have to increase their fertilizer rate 50%, you know, so I suppose that at some point, you know, that if we lost all our topsoil, we'd still be able to farm it for some, in some manner, but the, but it's, it's going to take a lot more fertilizer to do it. And the productivity of the ground is going to be less in a lot of areas. So, yeah, you know, so if you take out the tree row, you know, for goodness sake, think about change in tillage and cropping systems. But putting in back tree rows, you know, and designing it so that it would match modern equipment, that I think that's the best plan. There's another question in the chat box. Yeah, I see that it says, uh, form of, of, of DP, DP. Um, I Dissolved phosphorus? Means, yeah, there you go. It was a water quality concern. What's your sense percentage during a long-term inundation versus wind erosion loss P? So when I brought this up to the, when I brought the wind erosion and the, and the wind blowing it into the water systems, into the people, uh, we had a, a couple pretty good sized meetings in, in Crookston earlier. Uh, last year, winter of last year, and uh, they had never thought of that before. Uh, but I think it's a big, I think it's a real deal. Uh, Mick here pointed this out when we were talking about is, you know, the farms down at the Cheyenne grasslands. But if you, if you drive on 18 and you come down into the Cheyenne Valley and then come back up the other, other side, uh, there, there are bluffs on the west side of the side of the road. Those bluffs were not there before 1930. Those bluffs, if you core into those bluffs, you'll find trees underneath it. Those bluffs cover the trees that were there in 1930. So, you know, the the wind that's deposited, in, you know, not only in those trees, but in the in the rivers themselves. But I think there's general consensus that most of the phosphate in the Red River is coming from stream bank, stream bank erosion. Uh, for one thing, and then the other thing is the when the when the plants growing in that riparian area rot in the spring of the year during the during the thaw, the organic phosphate is dissolved. If you look at little water ponds in ditches and in in areas where water sits in the springtime, it kind of has the color of kind of a a weak tea, and that tea contains the dissolved phosphate from those plant parts and, and goes north. Some work by Don Slayton at University of Manitoba it shows that very clearly. 
The wind is not zero, but we don't know how much it is. It's really hard to measure wind in a specific place. So Dave, I have one more question for you. Um, so if you're feeling pretty hopeless about soil erosion and you want to get started with some new practices, what would be what would be your you know first five steps maybe to to implementing some of these uh, practices to reduce erosion? Well, I th I, th I think certainly incorporating some cover crop into into the program. Uh, it uh, it seems to be a, a better plan if it's after a small grain, uh, and and certainly you know the the, the poor man's cover crop is always 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 you know leaving the volunteers grow. Uh, it used to be that if anybody saw anything green after a barley crop or after a wheat crop, that you know goodness, you know send somebody out there right away and turn it black, but. Uh, why not let it grow for a little bit? You know, that you, sh you take the take the wheat crop in August, early September. Um, you know, that it, even even a person could go out and and uh, and work the ground if they needed to um, late in the month. You know, usually a time to do that. So that would be the first step. The the second step would be to uh, go to your some of your cafe talks. Uh, and learn from others that are in various stages of transition because at each of those cafe talks that I've been to anyway, uh, there's people that have been in no-till and successfully for a very long time on a variety of different soils. Uh, people are just starting out and people have been in it for a few years and so you can get some tips from them. Each each farm is unique. Uh, each each person has their own economic constraints and soil constraints and so there is there is no recipe. You can't just go into the soil health cookbook and find um, find something that's going to work for everybody. So what about the trees? Is there any uh, still bit of room for trees along with managing other issues? Yeah, I think so. There's there's a program, at least I'm pretty sure there's a program. The North Dakota Forestry uh, Division uh, usually has a program where they can cost share. They can go in uh, and, and they have a chopper and they can kind of clean out all the junk that a lot of times is in there. Uh, and um, and stimulate uh, the growth of whatever is there, and if and, and they can help with with putting new tree rows in. A lot of people that take advantage of this are people that are or homeowners out in the or landowners out in the in the country, and they use it to plant trees around their houses and renovate that. But but you can certainly use it to renovate tree rows that are in a farm field. Um, I'm I'm not sure that that was the basic intent, but a person could take advantage of that certainly. You mentioned about the Crookshin workshop. Um, I thought it was a very good program, um, but we should follow up on that because um, that was just the first of, um, I think, many workshops we should have. The um, the best management practices for the Red River Basin. I had a chance to review that about two months ago. So Dave Mulla, who's the kind of the spearhead on the writing of that, is. Uh, in the in the midst of the kind of the final version, but I was impressed with what he put together. Okay. So the the question is on a wet spring like we're having, the cover crop from fall seeding is inhibiting many growers from getting into the field. Um, I I find that surprising. Uh, only only issue there. Usually if you have a if you have a cover crop that it's easier to have some trafficability. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that we would have a spring or a fall that would that would mean that we would have such tremendous tr crop growth that it would it would inhibit drying of the fields at all and it would be interesting to see if there were neighboring fields that people were able to plant but the cover crop uh, would not I, I I can't I don't know maybe it's true but uh, it's it's hard for me to imagine that I just wrote an article on the in the crop and pest report about the treacherous uh, nature of our fields this year the the fields particularly in the center and the eastern part of this the state are just 
really horrible to work with because uh, people are people are getting stuck several times in a in a field co-host has asked you to start my video okay all right so I'll start my video and you can see the top of my head all right so there we are in my shiny shiny glasses so the fields for everybody that's just taken forever for them to dry up just forever you know it doesn't matter if you're conventional or no-till in the east it's just taking forever for these things to dry out um, I've been working with a couple of collaborators to try to get some plots in and of course that's not their main concern but uh, even on some sandier soils up on the hills uh, last week was a total bust you know the the farmer tried to put on ammonia and they it worked on a small three corner field he had and then he started in a sandy field north of his house and and uh, went over the hill and buried the tractor and it took him the afternoon to to pull the pull the tractor and the and the anhydrous applicator out it's just been horrible uh, and then custom applicators getting stuck three four times in the field uh, it looks dry on top and then it's not it, it's there's the the field is soft underneath there for a variety of reasons that i hope um, i've um, answered questions when the crop and pest report comes out so i find it really difficult to imagine the cover crops as a reason why it's inhibiting many growers. Just, uh, we had, from the central part of the state to the eastern part of the state, I looked this up this morning before I wrote my crop and pest, we had 10 inches of rain from the 1st of September until like yesterday. And it doesn't count the rain that we had in the last 24 hours. And that's and that's a period of time where either there isn't any crop growing in the, in the in the field or the crop is nearing maturity and isn't using much water, so it's it's basically ten inches of of water with really nothing happening, and that's a lot. And it's moving in weird places. It's going sideways and discontinuity. People from from tilling and doing their normal operation and what we had one seventy degree day since what. September <laughs> and and hardly any sun and when it is sunny it seems like it's 45 degrees it's just been a horrible 12 months just horrible so I don't know I guess I, it's hard for me to blame a cover crop for that in regards to, in regards to ammonia isn't that counterproductive this year wouldn't this be better off planting and spreading fertilizer on top um in in uh, in some sandy loam type fields you know it dries it, it's it, it dries and covers up and this farmer is the only actually takes my suggestion and actually has disc covers on his ammonia applicator so it doesn't leave trenches it always covers it up but um but no, I, I, I think in some soils, uh, ammonia even in a, in a spring like this just works fine as long as the tractor doesn't bury itself. The surface is dry. It's, a, it's the boils underneath there that are happening for various reasons that are causing people headaches. There's a comment in the chat box about some conifer tree shelter boils. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I see that conifer tree shelter belts work well. They're narrow and effective. Uh, I think everybody is pretty uh, aware of, of some of the old tree belt type systems where they'd start out with something like a lilac and then graduate to an intermediate sized tree and then a larger tree. And then on the other side, you do the same thing on the opposite, you know, go into an intermediate. You know, I don't think they need to be 60 feet wide. Uh, you have to be careful of conifers because they don't like salts very much. So if you do have a field that has some salts, I'm not sure the conifers are really the thing to do. But if if, if you're in an area that has some fairly low salts, maybe under one EC, then then getting some of those established that would that would work just fine. And they are are narrow and they are thick and they last. Going back to that uh, comment or question about uh, cover crops might be a reason for not having good traffic ability. Here at this station, we have some buses. These are the areas where we are driving, at least I'm driving, without having any issues. 
some field, most of the fields were not tilled because it was a very wet fall. But actually the fields which were not tilled last fall are better in terms of traffic ability compared to where somebody tried to tell the wet fields. So even there, there is a little bit of difference. But the, the grasses are still brown, but they provide a thick mat to drive over them. Yeah, that's why I find that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say it's not true because, you know, maybe it is, but I think overall, looking at fields that have cover crop on them and not to have cover crop on them, the ability to dry and to do field, drive and do field work uh, in fields that have cover crops uh, is overwhelming compared to fields that are just left black. That, that's just been my experience. I would say one thing though, that uh, for example, if somebody had uh, cereal rye, for example, or these perennial grasses, I think they turn green uh, in the spring. Um, annual crop cover crops will basically die. Um, the, but the perennial ones or the cereal rye, which over they can still use some water and they could dry out the fields quicker compared to the annual cover crops. Yeah, they do. That's, that's one of the reasons why we suggest that people use them. I don't think the rye right now is all that tall. How tall is it, Abby? Do you know or name? You know, you... Go ahead, Abby. I, I don't have any rye here, so. I've only been getting pictures since I've been stuck at home, but I, you know, it's, it's not more than a, a couple inches tall right now, but, um, but once it does start getting warmer and it's going to really help, I think, dry some of these, these soils out. Um, but I, th I think a lot of the, the cover crop and water usage comes down to what are you putting in the mix? And, and say you seed a, oh, let's see, he's saying that this field of cover crop rye won't hold a four wheeler. It's in the valley. Um, yeah, I can see, <clears throat> I can see some issues with that. Um, so, okay. So for example, if you, so say you have some cereal rye, it gets in a little bit late in the fall. Um, doesn't get much growth. The spring um, has minimal growth. You can pretty much imagine that what's on the surface is probably what's underneath as far as roots. Um, but I think too soon as we can't expect cover crops to work complete miracles. Um, you know, it's, it's, they, they can do a great job, but I think we have to um, also keep in perspective what they can do when fields like this are all wet. I mean, it's, it's when it's wet, it's wet. Um, no matter what tillage system you're in, no matter how much, how many cover crops you're using. Um, but I think it comes down to two, how much moisture could you use the year before? Um, so say it's prevent plant field going into this year and, and you put all warm seasons in there and you didn't have any cool seasons in the mix using moisture at those other times of the year um, or, or something that overwinters. So I think it's, there's, there's really kind of an art to selecting the, the cover crops you want in there, especially in a full season, or if you're seeding something after wheat harvest, um, then you definitely are gonna be stacking with cool seasons and possibly one that will overwinter to, to help use some moisture. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've walked in very wet fields um, where rye has been in it, hasn't been growing an, enough yet, and, and I make it across it walking, but I wouldn't be driving across it um, just because my expectations of that field are, are such that that I know if it can carry me or not. And then, you know, the tillage practices that are used and how long they've been used and the road dictate what you can do in the spring on those fields. Yeah, so I'd be interested to know when the cover crop rye was put in. You know, we, we have some rye up at Gardner and the place is a swamp all last year. I mean, the corn didn't even make a hundred bushels. And, uh, and some, of the, some of the corn didn't come up very good. We lost a rep out of it, I know. Uh, and the rye itself, it suffered all year. I mean, the 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 water table is almost to the surface the, in the most entire year. And if you would have been able to put a and the rye, I haven't been up there yet this spring, but I I doubt if the rye is all that big, and it's had much chance to use much water at all. And 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 sometimes the reason a put person's putting a cover crop in there is because they anticipate a wet mess anyway. And then they're they're right, and it is a wet mess. And but the cover crop, you know, hasn't gotten any size, and we haven't had the weather that's needed for the for the cover crop to take up much water at all. And it hasn't really developed much of a root system. And so things we normally see with with putting the putting the rye out there of have been able to hold the soil together and make it so it's not a soup. None of those things happened. 
Yeah, I remember one year digging around in the spring and, and a lot of rye on different fields and it was the top two inches were being dried out by the rye because that's where the roots were. Um, but like you're saying, Dave, they didn't have any opportunity to go deeper because it was either already saturated below and they weren't going to go into that um, just because of the plant. You know, it's, it's not going to go into saturated soils like that and, and develop if they have all the water they need at the surface. Um, and it was kind of, it was disappointing for that farmer too because they had seeded all this rye and it was drying out the surface really well because that's where the roots were and it didn't have much growth and it wasn't going much deeper because it was saturated. And that could be the same situation now. Um, you know, and, and there wouldn't be any reason for a plant to put down deeper roots into the saturated soil if it has what, it's, what it needs at the surface. Um, so that could be some of the, the frustration. Yeah. With. And, it, and it can't really, I mean, rye isn't rice. You know, it, it, most, of our, most of our crops do not root down in the saturated soil. They just can't, you know, there's no oxygen. They need oxygen to live. Rice seems to be able to get by with that, but, and, and some crops do, you know, some plants do, of course, because there's there's plants that grow in in ponds, but um, our crop crop plants are not made like that. So if you just have the roots at the surface, it's not going to do much to dry things out until it does dry out, and then the roots can get a little bit deeper, and then it can help out. Um, I've thought all winter that this is a crappy year to talk to people about cover crops, and I'm learning that right now, being reminded of that right now because. Um, everything that could go is going wrong. So Dave, what do you think though about like if people want to throw in some some oats as a cover crop with their soybean to use some of this extra moisture this spring? You know? I think that's a I think that's just a slam dunk idea if they have iron deficiency chlorosis problems at all. I, th I think that's really 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 a good idea really a good idea. So I see another one in, in the chat box from Ross. Um. So disease moving from the rye to the, oh, from wheat stubble? I don't know, we really haven't seen a disease problem in growing rye into wheat stubble, have we? Not really? Not that I've seen, I'm trying to think. Um, I asked Andrew Friskop this past year about somebody had barley as a full season cover crop on prevent plant and they wanted to put barley in again this year. And that was, that was a potential for disease issues, but maybe because rye is going to come off early. Um, yeah. I don't know. This might be the wrong mix for a disease question. Uh, that'd be a, that'd be an email to Andrew Frisk up our, our plant pathologist in, in small grains. Uh, when I think of rye, I think maybe about ergot, but, uh, you know, it has to be, but I don't know the scab. I don't even know if scab hits rye. I have no idea. Coming back to planting oats um, as a companion crops with soybean, I, I think it's a very good idea because a couple, couple different reasons. Uh, oats are salt tolerant too. So uh, that they would, they would kind of, a, one thing we have observed that when we planted a perennial salt tolerant grass mix and threw in some alfalfa seed, normally alfalfa won't do well on those areas. And it would take alfalfa two, three years, but the grass is kind of like nurture alfalfa. So I see the same potential here. And then um, it takes soybean a little bit of time to close the rows and when people roll soil blows so that oats crop can actually reduce minimize the blowing of topsoil too once the rows are closed then then soybeans can also but between the, the rolling of the fields and by the time the rows are actually closed there's quite a bit of soil which blows away I tried to drive the pickup yesterday morning to go to that um, site where we are planning to plant barley and um, oats. And I just the front tires of the pickup went into the field and I got it stuck. And um, I got lucky that I was able to get out of that field on my own. You know, the fields are just weird. I mean, they look like they're going to be okay. And then they're just soft underneath. It's 
So I realized I was thinking that I'm much more heavier than the pickup, but I realized that the pickup was heavier than me because I was walking and I was fine, but the pickup got us stuck. I, I mentioned something in the, and I don't know if this is a thing or not, but it just, uh, it just hit me. But um, geologists talk about uh, when you have clays and small particles in, in soil and sediment, and, and they're thinking about building buildings and things and what to put down there. Um, that once there's a certain amount of water in there, it, it they call it a they call it a gel, kind of like Jello. And under normal circumstances, the Jello is fairly firm, but then when there's a vibration or then it all turns to liquid, and down you go. And so, especially in areas that have earthquakes and that kind of thing, they have to especially build the foundations so that it's not susceptible to the gel liquefaction. Fortunately, we don't have earthquakes in North Dakota or we'd all sink and we'd all die. But, um, but that would happen here. And maybe that's happened in the field too. I mean, you're walking around, there's not much vibration, but you drive a truck or something like that over. Um, and, um, and the soils would just kind of turn to liquid because of the vibration. I don't know, but it's a, it's a thought. Well, it seems to me that well, we are running out of the question. So, well, thank you very much, everyone. And then um, just as a reminder that we'll be back on Thursday with the fourth webinar. Dr. Marisol Birdie would be talking about cover crops uh, based on your cropping system, how to select a mix which works for you, um, not just a general recipe. And then we'll have two more next week. So 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm.